That doesn't mean we don't love other things. But do we need to say it? I mean, when we love the Lord, we love the Lord. Amen? Got to have a little soul. <laughs> Got to have a little soul. We just thank you tonight, Lord, that that's the desire of our heart to come into this place where we are one with you in spirit and truth, and God, that you are moving through our lives in a mighty way. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, Padreo. All right, everybody. Tonight, we're looking forward to the study that we're going to be doing because it's not just a study, it's life. It's a study in life. We're going to talk about something that Jesus refers to in the Gospels and Mark, starting in Mark chapter 4. Verse 28. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he puts it in the sickle because the harvest has come. I want to talk about the four seasons of revival or cycles. And this relates to what Jesus is talking about. But I'm adding one thing to this, and that is the seed. Because before you can have the blade, before you can have the, the stem and then the kernel, of the wheat, you have to have the seed. If I was to draw a picture tonight and show you what it looks like to produce wheat, and this is what Jesus was referring to. When you have wheat, you first of all have to have a seed. Seed has to go into the ground. I mean, we all know that. That's common sense. But then comes up the up the stem and the blade, and then the kernel 
and this is what Jesus is referring to. But I, I want to look at this tonight and break it down in, into four different aspects of revival. The first one tonight we're going to look at is the seed. The, the, the seed and the ground that really is the beginning of any revival, you have to have the hard ground has to be tilled. If you were to go out today and plant a field, you would have to, first of all, till that field. You would have to take and make the field ready. So it can then receive the seed. And you need a lot of things. You need the rain. And we'll get into that. But but I'm not looking at this just from the standpoint of wheat or giving you a lesson in, you know, basic uh, science. <laughs> but more or less, to give you an illustration of when God is moving and what happens and what to expect when God moves. And I believe this is what Jesus was looking at and referring to in his parables. He talks about seed and all of that in different cases. All right. Nice seeing you again. God bless you. Have a good night at work. So the first thing you got to have, if you're going to have revival in any way, shape or form, is you have to have a breaking up of the fallow ground. Now, the seed has to have good ground, obviously, and that's one of the things that Jesus talks about. And we'll get to that. But starting out in this message, when we think about revival, or you're thinking about, um, you know, maybe scriptures that deal with this, Hosea 10, 12 comes to mind. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. And I was thinking about this article that I had read, uh, read quite a while back on by Charles Finney. And it's about breaking up the fallow ground. The Jews were a nation of farmers. And it is therefore a common thing that for God to refer in Scripture to scenes from their daily lives as illustrations. Hosea addresses them as a nation of backsliders, but uses words that farmers and shepherds are familiar with. He rebukes them for their idolatry and sharply warns them of the impending judgments of God. Follow ground is ground which has once been tilled, but has gotten hard and now lies waste. So what is that a picture of? Well, it sounds to me a picture of the church. You have a church that maybe at one time was on fire for God, that was alive, that had all the, 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 the things of God operating in it. But then all of a sudden comes a day when they no longer have that fire. They no longer have the outpouring of the Spirit. You could look at a lot of denominations today and, and you could make the claim that they're they're operating on follow ground. Look at the Methodist. They used to be referred to as the shouting Methodist. They were full of life, full of the spirit. And now look at them. M many of the Methodist churches today are dead. I'm not saying all of them, and I'm not making a generalization. Well, I am, but I'm really not. <laughs> Maybe I am. But you look at a lot of Methodist churches, and, and man, they're barely ever seemingly to be alive and you're wondering to yourself like well how does this happen how do you have like presbyterian churches which by the way charles finney was considered a presbyterian thank you sir but you understand that the reason for this is because people allow themselves or denominations can do it as a whole or individuals can do it. We can allow ourselves, anybody at any time can allow ourselves to become hard-hearted. Follow ground is ground which has once been tilled but has gotten hard. Now it lies waste. It needs to be broken up and made soft again before it is ready to receive seed. 
If you mean to break up the fallow ground of your heart, you must begin by looking at your heart. Examine carefully the state of your mind and see where you are. Many people never even seem to think about doing this. They pay no attention to their own hearts and never know whether they are doing well in their walk with the Lord or not, whether they are bearing fruit or are totally barren. Now you must draw up your attention from all of the things and look into the right Look into this right now. Make a business of it. Do not be in a hurry. Self-examination consists of looking at your life, considering your motives and actions, calling up your past and seeing its true character, looking back over your past history. Take up your individual sins one by one in your past life. Now, some of this I'm going to say, Finney was quite strict on in his teaching and i i don't see a problem with repentance by any means of the word but some of this like to go back over every sin i mean depending on how bad how bad of a person we were before we came to christ this may be a bit of an impossibility i mean just saying so maybe that's not what he's saying in 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 total but but there is something here that we can we can meditate on. Number one, look at the things that can easily become overall, instead of individual, but overall can become something that could cause us to become lukewarm. Ingratitude, unthankfulness. Take this sin, for example, and write down under this heading all the times you can remember where you have you have received great blessing and favors from God for which you have never given thanks. A lack of love for God. Think how grieved and alarmed you'd be if you suddenly realized a great lack of affection for you in, in, in your wife, husband, or children. If you saw that someone else had captured their hearts, thoughts, and time. Perhaps in such a case, you would almost die with a just and holy jealousy. Now God calls himself a jealous God. Have you not given your heart to other loves and infinitely offended him? Wow. Neglect of the Bible. Put down the cases where, where for perhaps weeks or longer God's word was not a pleasure to you. Some people indeed read over whole chapters in such a way that afterwards they could not tell you what they had been reading. If that is so with you, no, no wonder your life has no direction and your relationship with God is in such a miserable state. Unbelief. Recall the instances in which you have virtually charged the God of truth with lying by your unbelief of his express promises and declarations. If you have not believed or expected to receive the blessings, which God has clearly promised you, you have called him a liar. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, by the way, did I mention you? This was Charles Finney, the great revivalist. Charles Finney lived in the 1800s. And I know I've shared this many times on, on here, but Finney would go to a town. He, lived in New York. This is back in horse and buggy days. They didn't have highways and high rises and high fis and Wi-Fi and all that. But he lived in that era where they had horse and buggies. And he would go to a town in a week or two before he would start holding meetings. And all they would do would pray. They'd pray for the town that God would bring it under conviction. And then when it came time, Finney would rent a building and he would start having meetings where he would preach. And there was, every time he went somewhere, God would move. And it would get to the point where bars would shut down because there'd be nobody going to the bar. They were all going to church and they were getting saved. And many times people would be under such conviction in these meetings that they would fear that they were going to go to hell if they didn't, if they didn't get forgiveness. There was such conviction, and it was the Spirit of God moving. But what God was doing is the season that we're going to talk about tonight, breaking up the follow ground. Revival is a term that means to revive. Well, you can't revive something that doesn't exist. A sinner 
or somebody that has not repented and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior cannot be revived because they've never been born. Revival is for the church. It's for the, the body of Christ. It's for us that know the Lord, but maybe we've gotten cold-hearted. Maybe we've turned away from the Lord. Maybe we've backslidden, and we need to come back to the Lord. And so revival is that aspect of God bringing us back in relationship to him and reviving us. And so when Finney is talking about these things in his lecture here, he's talking about a lack of prayer. Think of all the times you have neglected private prayer, family prayer, and group prayer meetings, or you've prayed in such a way as to grieve and offend God more than if you hadn't prayed at all. <laughs> I like it. Some of the stuff he says, though, it's like, wow, okay. Neglect of fellowship. When you have allowed yourself to make small and foolish excuses that have prevented you from attending meetings, when you have neglected and poured contempt upon the gathering of the saints merely because you didn't like the church. A lack of love for souls. Look around all your friends and relatives and think of how little compassion you have felt for them. You have stood by and seen them going straight to hell. It seems as though you didn't care. A lack of care for the poor and the lost. A lack of watchfulness over your witness. Neglect to watch over your brethren. Neglect of self-denial. A love of possessions. Vanity, envy, bitterness, slander. He talks about robbing God, hypocrisy, cheating, lying, levity, bad temper, hindering others from being useful, etc., etc. Revival is when God moves on people in the church to bring them back into right relationship with him. And when you see people coming, and, and this is what I believe God is, is wanting to do. I believe this this season of revival is important because it's twofold. Number one, God wakes up the church, the sleeping giant, the church, the body of Christ, and he begins to revive her with the Holy Spirit coming. And when you see this, you see people coming down to altar somewhere or, or laying down on the floor prostrate or in their pew and they're praying and, and numbers of people are getting right with God. This is the beginning of revival. In revival, the first cycle, it is the overwhelming repentance, the agony of soul, deep conviction. We see much of this in the church as it's stirred up. The pew dwellers get uncomfortable. Sin is exposed and hearts get broken before God. This is the first cycle of revival. It's the most necessary part of it because it is because it starts the process of tilling the ground. God can't work on ground that is hard and untilled. He must first soften those hard clods of earth representing our heart. God can't move through us if we're hard-hearted. And that's the problem, is that in so many uh, Christian Christians today and in Christianity, there's a lot of hardness in people. People grow hard because they want to do their own things. They're not listening to the Holy Spirit. They're not reading the word. They're not praying. They're not staying in fellowship with God. The ground must be softened. Hearts broken. And this is why God sends the former rain. Now the former rain in Israel is opposite to our harvest season here. Their harvest season starts in September, October. This is when they plant the seed. And this is where 
God sends the former rain, he says in his word. The former rain is to soften the hard ground. So whenever you see revival coming, the first thing you're going to see, the first cycle of, of the revival, the first season of that revival is always going to be the rain of repentance. That soft rain that comes upon the ground and causes people to get right with God. You see, that's what we need today in the church. People cannot go around in sinning and doing these things and then expecting God to bless them. That's not going to happen. God is a holy God. And his, his word is holy. And his ways are holy. And when God begins to move, he brings people up to his level, to his standards. God doesn't come down and meet us at our standards and say, okay, it's okay to compromise and do what you're doing. It's okay to live in sin. That God never operates that way. We either come up to him by coming down, bowing down to him and, and worshiping him, and then he lifts us up. That's how it works. He lifts us up when we bow down. It's the opposite today in the church. Many churches have this philosophy that God's going to come down to our level and somehow he's going to bless us in some way, even though there's sin, hypocrisy, and everything else operating. God doesn't work that way. Jesus came to Laodicea and he said that Laodicea in church in Asia Minor. He said, you are rich and increased with goods. Laodicea was a very wealthy city, a port right on the ocean. And they they provided all kinds of uh, like clothing and things like that. And they, and they had all kinds of mills and, and they made mills and like factories or they were producing goods and they were increased. But he said, one thing I have against you, you're neither hot nor cold. He said, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said. I know that's not flattering. But have you ever tried drinking coffee that was lukewarm? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, like, hey. Not good. But I'm telling you, Jesus said to that church, I see you. You think that you're okay. But he said, you're naked, you're miserable, and you're empty. And he told them to be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. And return to your first love. Return to that first love. But Jesus went through every church of the seven candlesticks in Revelation. And he addressed the pastors and the leaders. And every church he gave a rebuke. I think there was maybe the church of Philadelphia that didn't get a rebuke, but they still got chastened. But his point was, revival has to, first of all, repair the breaches. It has to repair the wall that is broken. It has to repair the church that is broken. Because the church is God's first love, his first passion is his people, his bride. When the bride is out of order, when the bride isn't walking in the white robes, if the bride isn't walking in the purity that he has called her to, she ceases to be able to have the power. This is why the church has become 
in many cases, anemic, without any power. Look at Samson. Samson was a man of strength. When he was walking in obedience, he was powerful. But as soon as his hair got cut, and that was his strength because he took a Nazarite vow, he wasn't allowed to, a razor, was not allowed to touch his head. But as soon as he was deceived and the razor, all right, God bless you. Good to see you. As soon as that razor touched his head, he lost his power. He lost his strength. He wasn't able to do those miracles and the things that he was doing. And, and the thing is, that's the church. Because when you see, when sin becomes entangled into the whole mess, and you got churches that are operating outside of Scripture, they're no, they're no longer biblical, they're no longer under the authority of Christ, you've got a mess out there. People talking about revival, but they're talking about stage four. When the harvest is being reaped and miracles are happening and all that, we're not there yet. We got to get past the first season, the former rain, the first rain of harvest. It's the planting season. The seed has to go into the ground, but it has to go on good ground. Jesus talked about good ground. You can't plant seed in bad ground because it won't work. Revival can't fully come until the church, the ground, is tilled. Now the rain comes to produce that seed that's being planted. Now, I think this is where we're at today in the kingdom of God. Now, these stages that I'm talking about, these seasons, they can be at all different time levels in the church. So one church could be seeing the blade and the stem. Another church can be seeing the kernel in its full wheat. Because we're not talking about in sync here. We're not talking about everybody's at the same level. We're not all at the same level. Churches are all at different places. Pastors are all at different places. But the one common thread of all of this is God will always unite his people around one thing, unifying us around Jesus Christ. That's for sure. That's a constant in the Bible. Paul said, strive for the unity of the faith. Strive for that. One of the themes of Paul the Apostle in his writings was unifying the church. When they were all in one accord, in one mind, what happened? The Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost. Why? Because they were all in one accord. They were all in one mind. They all were in agreement. Jesus said, if two or more of you will agree, the word agree is so important because it speaks of a unified outreach, a unifying of the church. When you've got churches that are at odds with each other, you got Christians that are attacking Christians and tearing down Christians. That's not going to be a, a, a good ground for God to work on. That's not good ground. That's bad ground. When you've got churches that are teaching that it's okay to you know, to be homosexual and just let that out. That's okay. And there's no standard of holiness and righteousness. And God condemned that sin in the Old Testament. He condemns it in the New Testament. That's his word. It's not my word. It's his word. But he condemns other sins, drunkenness and debauchery and all kinds of immorality. He condemns it. And we can't walk in those things and expect God to, to bless. That's bad ground. And God's not going to invest his seed in bad ground. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. By far, we're not. But in the grace of God, we ought to be striving, amen, for that perfection. Striving to be what he wants us to be. But where are we at? We're in this, I believe the church is in a, is in a season of sowing. Seed 
is being sown. Seed is being sown. The ground is starting to soften. As God begins to pour out his spirit on the church. The untilled ground is being tilled. The Holy Spirit is coming with the word and he's tilling the ground. He's calling the church to repentance. John the Baptist the spirit of of John the Baptist, the spirit of Elijah, to make ready the bride, to make straight the paths, to take the crooked way out, to make it smooth, to prepare the Lord for the coming of the Lord. That ministry is the tilling of the ground. It's the fertilizing of the ground. The ground must be softened. Hearts must be softened. And there's two rains in Israel. You have the seed sowing rain, the harvest planting rain in September, October. And then in and then April and May, you have the reaping of the harvest. So you have another rain, the latter rain that comes. And the latter rain prepares the harvest for being tilled, picked, harvested. And that's souls being saved. That's that's the salvation. That's when God begins to move in revival power and sinners are coming to Christ. The first rain is for the church. That's the preparation of the heart. The tilling of the ground. The second rain is for the world. Well, it's for the church, but it's for the church to, to be able to go out and harvest the world, the lost. So now, where are we? We're in the seed bearing time. Now, I don't want to get too much confusion. On these things like, well, one, one is for that, one is for that. Because, I mean, God is moving. And, and and obviously, even in the seed where God is dealing with the church, there's going to be God dealing with the world as well. There's going to be sinners saved at all times. But the rain, the seed, and it is twofold. Number one, it's the seed that God's sowing in us of repentance, sowing in righteousness. That's the seed, number one. Number two, it's the seed of sowing into the into the ground of this world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The seed of the gospel that touches those that are not saved, that are not regenerated, so that they come to Christ through the seed of his word, and they're saved. So these two things are happening simultaneously in revival. You have the church coming alive. You have church people repenting. I call them pew dwellers. (laughs) The pew dwellers are getting saved. No, the pew dwellers are getting rededicated and revived. The sleepers, the ones that need to be awakened. And then you have... Once the church gets awake, gets alive, the church gets convicted, the church gets concerned. And once the church is concerned, the church starts to reach out and preach the gospel. The other day I was walking into the field where I go to pray. It's a baseball field park. And on the ground was a rock about that big. And it had a piece of paper on it, and it had a scripture verse with a phone number of a church. If you find this rock and you're lost, call this number. And I like that. That's thinking out of the box. That's creative. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? This is this is this is what the revival looks like. It looks like Christians that are operating in the spirit 
and doing things to reach out to bring sinners to Christ. Amen. So in the winter, there's another rain. It's called a moderate rain in Israel. And it, it kind of gives the, the seeds that have been planted a little boost. I think sometimes we just need that. A little boost from God. A little rain to help us, to get us through. Amen? So there's really three rains that we see in Israel that has to do with the harvest. That has to do with the harvest. What I call revival because when I see these things happening and it'll make sense when we go through this message how these things really line up with with what god's doing the full rain comes in the in, in the um in the autumn in the planting season because that seed needs a lot of rain amen it needs a lot of rain Revival is much like harvesting wheat. The season lasts all year, basically, starting with the planting. We see in Scripture the planting being mentioned many times by Jesus, even in his parables. The cycle or the seed in revival, we see this as the initial phase, the beginning, the autumn rain. Now forget about the autumn and, and, and forget about the spring. We're talking about rain. We're not talking about it now in a naturalistic sense of rain. But I want to look at this and turn this into what it really is. And that is a rain... That comes from God. A rain. That comes from God. The Holy Spirit rain. In Joel 2. We see it. Behold, the Lord says, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. But he says, first of all, repent. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. And I shall, and it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams, young men shall see visions. Also on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God said he's going to pour his spirit out. And he's going to he's going to restore the former rain and the latter rain. He's going to restore the rain. Now, that is exactly what God said he would do in Zechariah, the 10th chapter. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Ask me, the Lord says, and I will give you rain. I will pour out on you rain. Now that's rain in scripture is a reference to the Holy Spirit. 
He's not talking about physical rain. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about pouring out his spirit. Revival is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is no revival without God's spirit moving. You could call it a lot of different things. It's not a church meeting. It's not a religious convocation. It's not something that a denomination starts. It's not something that comes from inside organized religion. Revival comes from heaven. It comes from God. It's not given any kind of uh, approval of man, but it is heaven approved. When God pours his spirit out, that is coming from God, that is coming from heaven, and that is touching those in whom he wants to touch. And that is what we're looking for today. That's what we're praying for. God, pour out your spirit on us. Pour your spirit out. Because we're thirsty for it. We want the Holy Spirit. We want God to move. We want people to get saved. We want to see lives changed. Amen? That is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what God said he would do. Would you say amen? In this cycle of revival... Just like Israel that was busy with the hustle and bustle of planting seed. The whole family got involved in this, even children. And it would be a very joyful and happy time in Israel as families would go out and, and, and bear the seed, throwing the seed out into the field. And then praying for God to send the rain which he did, according to his promise. He that goes out bearing precious seed with tears will come back in waving the sheaves of wheat. In Psalm, David wrote that psalm. He that goes out bearing precious seed and sometimes in tears. There could be tears of joy. It could be tears of sadness. It could be tears of struggle. Welcome, cat. Welcome. But we understand that tears in the Bible represents a release of someone's heart and their mind to God. Especially when it comes to these things. Now, I said this in this message, and I think it it is something that we got to understand that Jesus came on this earth to bear seed. Yeah, hey, thank you. Welcome. He came onto this earth to, to bear that seed of his gospel. And he shared his gospel with those that were down, those that were oppressed, those that were poor, those that were diseased, demon-possessed, sick, the outcast. Jesus didn't come to the palaces and the cathedrals of his day. He went to the poor, to the needy. Okay. I think we're all good here. <laughs> but good, it's good to do that because there are bad people on the site that need to go. But Jesus shared with people that were broken by life. And that is an interesting thing because, like I said, he wasn't trying to make it 
rich. He wasn't trying to make it famous. He wasn't trying to do this in some kind of a egocentric way. Jesus was consumed with only one thing, and that is, number one, doing what his father wanted him to do. Number two, he wanted to bring good news to oppressed people. Amen. There you go. So we need to have the same compassion and purpose as Christ when it comes to doing his work. And revival by revival will always bring to the forefront those people that are most needy and the most necessary in God's plan. Jesus reached out to people, but not only did he reach the poor and not only did he reach the down and out, but there were those that were leaders of the Jews that got saved. So he did reach everybody. But the point is, if the church isn't grieving, agonizing, praying, and diligently seeking the lost, then it's a church, quite frankly, that's missing the mark of what Christ called the church to do. The only job of the church is to save souls and to look after the sheep, make sure the sheep are walking with the Lord. But if you take those two aspects of the church, it's a huge undertaking. It's not something small. It's not a small, minimal task. It's a huge task. It takes hours and hours of manpower. It takes people. It takes all kinds of things. It takes money. It takes finances. It takes a lot of things. But if you look at it from the standpoint of what Christ did, he set the example. And the churches that that don't that have authors that are not stained with tears for the lost souls, there can be no revival. There can't be a revival in a church where people aren't really caring for people that are lost and without Jesus. And so this whole thing boils down to we have different things that are going on. Yeah, this is a Bible study. So just let me close with this. The process of the of the wheat. It is Sunday, Sunday night here. You, Where are you at? What part of the world are you in? You must be in another part of the world because it's still Sunday here. So that, that there are two rains that we think of which help the wheat to process and to grow. James chapter 5, he talks about this a little bit too. And when we think about James, the book of James, there in the old uh, New Testament. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold is corroded. Cry out, and as the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath, You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. So 
So James is talking about people that don't care about other people. Now, I don't know how we could be a Christian, to be honest with you, if we're going to be a Christian and follower of Jesus and not care about people. Because it should be in our nature. We have to be willing to be like Jesus. If we're not like Jesus and we're just like the world, there's no difference. The one thing that set the church apart from everybody else was that the love they had one for another. Jesus said, they'll know you by the love you have one for another. They'll know you. They'll know you. They'll see that you're different. So when you have churches that have, you know, million dollar airplanes <laughs> flying around <laughs> in the name of the Lord. And yet the people down the street don't have any food. Veterans are on the street corner with no food, bagging for food. And a guy's flying a million dollar jet in the name of Jesus. That doesn't add up. That doesn't add up. And the world sees that and they go, aha, that's corruption. But I tell people, that's not Jesus. That's somebody's interpretation of Jesus that they've made based on their own egocentric lifestyle. It has nothing to do with God. We need to be willing to share the gospel with the poor, the rich, and whoever. And the seed has to be planted. And that's the revival. In every single revival in history, there was the, the call to the Christian to wake up, to come alive. And to answer the Holy Spirit's call and, and, and break up the follow ground of the heart. And then be a witness to take the gospel and be willing to share it with anyone. How dare we hoard this gospel to ourselves? How dare we not share it? Who are we? Who are we? In this age, to think that we don't need to share Jesus or even, well, that's not how God works. We just go to church and God sends people to us. No, no, that's not what Jesus said. He said, go into all the world. You look at this and you say to yourself, you've got people that are in churches where they have gold on their pulpits they could cut that gold <laughs> they can cut the gold off that altar <laughs> and feed half of their city You follow me? I agree with that. I'm not saying that somebody, you know, the Bible says don't muzzle the ox's mouth. Don't tread the ox. In other words, if somebody preaches, if somebody does something for the Lord, they ought to, they ought to get benefited from that. There's no doubt about it. But, when people are out there flying million dollar airplanes, living in five houses, Jesus comes back. They're going to have a lot to answer for. Why didn't you feed the poor? 
the church, the body of Christ, man, we ought to be taken care of. We got more homelessness in this country. It's disgusting. San Francisco, L.A., Skid Row. The world's not going to do it. They don't have compassion. They don't understand. It's their job. They do. Oh, the government will do it. The government will take care of them. No, Jesus calls the church. I tell you what, five churches in Los Angeles, if they got together and they tithe, instead of making churches bigger and bigger, if you get five mega plux churches and they would all give five dollars we could wipe out homelessness Amen. hey how you doing Good. all right well i'll be out in a minute i'm in the middle of a live stream okay so you see what i'm saying and so we have to come back to We have to come back to what's real <laughs> and what's actually going to make a difference in people's lives. So let's let's close in prayer and believe God to send revival to us every single day, that the rain will fall. Let's pray. Lord, tonight we ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would send the rain. that rain of of the of the sowing season in our lives that you would break up the fallow ground of our hearts that you would speak to your church lord in america and around the world that you would speak to us lord where we put prosperity and when we put other things above the gospel lord that you would bring us to repentance in jesus name that you would break up the hollow fallow ground of those hearts that are hard we pray for the rain to come and soften the hearts of people and turn us back to god as never before in this country this nation lord that is a wealthy nation but god is living in greed and selfishness i pray for a move of god on this nation for the poor to be fed and clothed for those that are destitute those that are oppressed of the devil, those that are sick and diseased, those that need a savior, a healer, a deliverer, the Lord, that they would find that in the gospel. They'd find it in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you would move by the power of God, that you would set us free as a church. Lord, send the rain tonight. Begin to send the rain upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I praise God tonight that we were able to share this message. And I hope and pray that it ministers to somebody out there that needs it. But if you've come tonight and you got a need in your life and you want Jesus to minister to that need, let us know what it is before we go and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you. For everyone that needs a touch in their body, that needs healing tonight, those that need salvation tonight, young people, Lord, across this nation and this world that need Jesus, we pray for conviction on them, Lord, that they'll come to Jesus and realize that they need life and life eternal. We ask God that you will move upon their lives in Jesus' name. And that they will come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I don't worry about other people. I would worry about yourself. Because you're going to stand before God and give an account of your life. And... I don't know who you are. I don't know how old you are. I don't know anything about you. But I know God knows you. And he sees you. You need to repent and turn to Jesus. 
and you need to give them your life because if you fool around and and stuff like that, you're just going to get further away from God, and that's not going to be good for you. So I challenge you, think about it, where you're at, 